Hey there guys, uh, Chapadong here, and we're doing a lot of talking in the uh, MLB Beginners Discord room this morning, having some great conversations with some members uh, about uh, kind of where we're going, where our games are, and kind of what we're planning on doing going forward. Uh, I know, me personally, I'm putting together these cash lineup videos where we're eliminating the vast majority of players down to a very tight player pool of 20 to 25 uh, players and it's working very well. We're like 15 and four now. We lost last night, but we're 15 and four now. Uh, it, it's a good, strong track record. Uh, it's still a small sample. This could go sideways in a hurry, but for now, it's showing good signs of working. I'm wanting to add in my own 100 man leagues. I love that format, always have. I find that the 100 man leagues that pay the top 12, everybody talks about, well, it doesn't pay very many people. Yeah, that's the trade off. But it pays so much better when you cash. And if you follow my methods of uh, tracking your scores and trying to get into the top 1%, trying to get into the top you know, 12%, trying to get into the top 50%, whatever, by tracking these 100-man leagues, you're going to find that building a top 5% lineup you know, that gets in the top 5 of these leagues or the top 1 of these leagues, a lot of times it takes a really good score to win them, but you can win on some lower scores. It's a little surprising because it's just not hard to beat 100 people. Uh, you don't have to build these truly miraculous lineups that hit on every single aspect. Because of that, they pay 25 times your buy-in. On a normal uh, GPP, or I wouldn't say normal, but on these MME, quarters, nickels, even some of these other uh, single-entry type, uh, you know, $1, $2 stolen base, whatever type of contests, now you're looking at on a 1% lineup, the same score that lands in the same level of competition is only paying you maybe 4x, maybe 5, upwards of 7 and 8 is what it used to be. But I would rather take 25x than even 7 or 8x when I'm trying to build a bankroll. You sacrifice a little bit of upside because, you know, if you get something that's in the top 10th of 1% or one of those truly miraculous lineups, you're only getting 25 bucks as opposed to maybe 100 or 500 dollars or whatever in the other contests but ask yourself this question how often are you really doing that anyway the trade-off is probably worth it especially when second place is like 15x so a two percent lineup a top two percent lineup, which is a significantly lower score in a lot of cases doesn't even barely min cash well i mean it, maybe 3x whatever min cash in tournaments is paying 15 times your buy-in and a 3% lineup is paying like 10 times your buy-in. I mean, these are big numbers for as often as you can hit these. these. You can reliably build these strength of lineups and hit these things and pretty much grow a bankroll. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to infuse these into um, the talking points of the videos that I'm making because I want to compare the cash lineup to the trying to win the 100 man leagues like i'll throw my cash lineup in a 100 man league because i'm just trying to track it see if it's in the top 50 top 30 top 20 whatever and these things are getting close to the top 12 a lot like i've cashed i think out of the 19 slates that i've done this i think i've cashed three times in the top 12 that's pretty strong for a quote unquote cash lineup that has no upside um but it's baseball everything has upside in baseball the stacked lineups are more volatile, so they're not going to finish as high as often as a cash lineup will, but they're going to hit higher when they do hit than a cash lineup does. So they're a little bit more up and down, but what we're trying to do is take a more volume-based approach to this. Let's do this for 50 slates. Let's do this for 100 slates. Let's do it and compare. If you're building strong enough lineups for cash games, or for then it doesn't matter. Build your tournament lineup the way you build your lineups and put it in a cash game. What, what's it matter? You don't have to necessarily learn new ways to play the same game if what you're doing is working. So prove to yourself it's working. That's where we're going to kind of go with this little series, this little series of videos. We'll pop a couple of them out to the public here and there. But we're going to mostly keep this in-house in, in uh, DFS Army for VIPs because you guys are the guys that are really driving the site. It's, it's your information. You guys are the ones that deserve it. Um, but I'm going to show you one little quick method here that we can really overthink these things, okay? And we can really get in our own head. I'm a simple-minded person, or I try to be. I'm actually a very complex-minded person. I get in my own way a lot. 
but I, I, that's why I focus on simplifying processes. Is I'm trying to get out of my own way. I find that if I let the optimizers and the projections do most of the work for me, my game is better. And if I do less research, my game is better. Some guys like to do a lot of research and they feel it gives them an edge. And that is perfectly fine for them. And I used to do a lot of that with DFS Army back in the early days. And I've got my own methods and I've got my own metrics and I've got my own statistics that I've invented and created. And then they work. But some things don't work. Some are just not very transferable because of the volatility of a game like baseball. And that's what I'll show you right now. I've used a site like this for runs per game. What is this? TeamRankings.com. Um, I can go into pitching stats. And this is where I really, really like this site. Earned runs against per game. And I can see which, if I sort by the 2022 numbers, I can see the, the teams with sucky pitching staffs. Cincinnati, Pittsburgh. Who coincidentally play each other today. Uh, Colorado, Washington, Kansas City, these are the guys that have a hard time pitching. These guys are allowing a lot of runs. These are the teams we should naturally be stacking against. And that works. It doesn't work in that sometimes San Francisco Giants get blown up for eight runs, right? Like the random stuff still happens. But more often than not, these are the teams we should be attacking. These are the teams that are most likely to implode. And this is where we want our bats you know, going up against these pitching staffs. Um, I like using moving averages. So I like taking the baseline of what this year is as the sample gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then use the last three games as a baseline. Is it higher? Is the number higher trending upwards or trending downwards? You know, like both these games, the pitching staffs are getting better because if you look at their numbers last year, I mean, they're going to be around this. 5.94 is going to come down. Cincinnati's going to start pitching a little bit better just by nature of the game. They're going to regress more towards a mean and that, for a while, is going to go cold against people stacking against Cincinnati purely as a method. Now, Colorado is way over what their baseline is. Colorado is really giving up runs right now. They're getting torched, so they should be attacked. So we can use these short-term baselines or moving averages against long-term baselines to time upswings and downswings. And I love doing that. So what I've done is I've gone into today's matchups for i believe the early slate and it's either early or the main i don't know which right now but i'm allowing earned runs against and then runs scored for the offense and the u is trending up or trending down based on that three game sample i'm not going to do this very often it requires a lot of work it's a pain in the ass but for today i want you to understand kind of where this might come from and where it might lead to some targets we can do this for say the top five or top 10 teams on a slate and target those teams. And we're overthinking it a little bit. And I'll explain why here in a second, but let's take San Diego 4.2 runs earned runs against, but they're trending way upward. Their three game sample is way higher than that. Atlanta trending upward at 3.7 Baltimore trending upward, trending upward, trending. There's only a couple teams that are trending downward and that's the two we really want to attack in Cincinnati and Pittsburgh. When I look at the offenses though, of these teams, and these are the opponents. I'm sorry. This is for San Diego, but it's actually Atlanta's um, earned runs against. So that because that's what we want to focus on is San Diego's bats, right? San Diego is in a good spot to attack Atlanta's pitching because Atlanta's pitching is giving up 4.2 runs against per game and is trending upwards at some like ridiculous five, six or seven runs per game over their last three. Now, runs scored goes back to the offense, though. So this is San Diego's runs scored right now is 4.5 runs per game on the season and it is trending upward they're scoring five or six runs per game right now over the last three or four games so they may be running a little bit hot we can use these numbers to kind of add together and find what is called a power score see if some team is facing really really bad pitching we're going to want to pay attention to them but if that team isn't scoring a lot of runs then which is going to come first, the chicken or the egg? Is it going to be the bad pitching that dictates the runs scored today? Or is it going to be the lack of offense from the sucky team that they're facing that just can't score any runs no matter what they do? So we put these things together on a sliding scale, if you will, and then we look at the overall number. And when I'm looking at that, I call it a power score. And when I'm looking at that, 87, it's just adding them together, right? 42 plus 45 is 87. 37 plus 42 is 79. So you can look at who's trending up and who's trending down, who's trending way up versus trending way down. Offense is weird, probably because they faced each other and their pitching staffs give up horrific runs allowed. So these two teams are probably 
worth focusing on again today. They've got the highest power score at 90 and 95, and then San Diego at 87, then what, a couple of teams at 83 and Milwaukee and Tampa Bay. So if you wanted to narrow down to just like the five best offenses on the slate, do this. And do it every day. Do it the same way every day. Same thing. You don't want to change your methodology if you find something that makes sense because you're trying to build a repeatable system and then track it over a large sample size so that the natural ups and downs of the game get washed out by a large sample size. It's like flipping a coin. If I flip a coin three times, I can get heads all three times. Well, we know that's not going to last. If I flip the coin a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times, it's going to normalize much closer to its true odds of a 50-50. If I do this with this methodology, I need to run this over hundreds of slates and then track it and see if it normalizes and if this is a good indicator of hitting the correct offenses. If it is, then we could maybe just run these five offenses in stack one and stack two of MLB and mix them and match them together and, have, and, and know that a lot of nights are going to be bad, but this is going to work out over the long run more often than any other method. If you like that idea, start doing something like this. But if you don't have the time to invest and push into this, then what you can do is just take the top five projected offenses off of the, you know, the leverage stacking tool or take the top 10 or take 2% of everybody, you know, like Scott Newman's doing with more towards the top and then, but still getting a little piece of everybody, whatever it is in my hundred man league challenge thing, I'm going to have to narrow this down to a couple of offenses because I'm only building a couple of lineups. I'm not building a hundred lineups. I can't cover every base. So I have to then, narrow things down a little bit. So I'm using methodologies or trying to find methodologies that work, but I won't have the time to do this little chart every single day. And honestly, in the times that I have done this in the streaks where I'll do it for a week or two and then I stop and then I come back in a few months and do it for a week or two and then I stop, it isn't really all that correlative or predictive in terms of who's at, I, if I built the sample size on it, I'd look at this thing and go, it doesn't really tell me anything because baseball is so random anyway that I don't know what team's going to go off, and this is not a good predictor. So it largely becomes a little bit of a waste of time. It makes a hell of a lot of common sense, but if it doesn't translate into predictive, predictable or predictivity or whatever the word would be, then it just, it just doesn't make sense. It's not worth investing the time into if you're getting steadier results elsewhere, which is what makes me go back to the top five projected offenses um, or whatever, I may use uh, K scores and W scores and Sierras in the old, uh, what we used to call it, Chin Music article, for those of you that know way back when, uh, we used pitching Sierra, home run per nine, uh, things like that to determine which pitchers might be going to give up the long ball uh, and bullpen numbers and whatever else. And we can use that, but sometimes that's not predictive either. We've got to find a method that we like, that we trust, and that we're going to stick with to narrow us down to say three to five teams in the 100 man leagues and then we can set the optimizer to only use those teams and mix and match stack one and stack two with one of those five teams in stack one and one of those five teams in stack two to use a good pitcher and then we can build we're going to find under the radar teams doing this we're going to find chalky teams doing this and we're going to mix and match and over the long run the goal is to have some of these 100 man leagues become very successful along with our cash game stuff compare and contrast the two together so that we can determine, should we just be building lineups the way we want to build lineups and then entering that in cash games? Or should we using be using by the book traditional cash game methodology? It, any of this works and it gives us a lot to talk about in the group. So I hope you guys find this video appealing. I hope that you guys find what we're doing, um, you know, maybe bringing up more questions than it answers because that's what's going to foster the discussion. That's what's going to steer the ship. That's what's going to drive the teaching and the coaching and the whatever else, and is going to benefit everybody as a whole. That's the idea of launching this kind of um, experiment today. Now, I'm not giving up on the MME stuff. I'm not giving up on the cash game stuff. I'm, not, I'm just adding this to it because I want a lot more to talk about with you guys because the more we talk, the more you guys think of questions, the more you guys become better players, the more you guys get more out of your VIP subscription at DFSArmy.com, and the more everybody ups their game that's always been the way we we kind of inhale and exhale as a group this is getting ready to be an inhale phase where i'm going to start really pushing some of this stuff as long as you guys interact with me and we talk about this stuff throughout the day it's going to make us all better players hopefully you guys come along for the ride this is just kind of the kickoff to show you what i plan on doing and i'm sure it'll change in a week or two a little bit here or there but this is where we're going to start from 
cash games, hundred man leagues, and some MME talk. And we're going to see where we go from there. Um, peace out homies. Give me a thumbs up or something like that. Let me know you like the material and let's, let's do this thing.